Okay, we are doing that recording at least. Let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna have to email them and see why why we seem to be having this problem. Yeah, it's hanging. Okay, let's. Let's just start, I it, guess. It will, it, yeah, it'll either start and people will miss a little bit, but we, we can always upload the, yeah, connections timed out. So yeah. Okay, great. Take it away. So welcome everybody to the next edition of VMAX. We are in, happy to have two exciting talks. The first will be a 10 minute presentation by uh, Giacomo Mangiante, his co-author Chris Stock here um, is here to answer questions via the Q&A as usual. And then we'll have Andre Gant also here with her co-authors, Mo and Jesse, and they'll be able to answer questions via the Q&A, and then we'll have a live conversation with questions at the end. Uh, the usual disclaimers apply to the chats, and uh, if you're ready, Jocko, you can share your screen and uh, yep. go ahead. Okay, double checking, can you see the screen? Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, uh, thank you for attending this presentation and thank you to the organizer for accepting our paper. This is a joint project between, between me and Christoph Lauer, uh, Christoph Lauer and the, the, the name is Modern Revolution Shock and Inflation in the World. Let me start by giving you some context. In uh, recent years, more and more focus has been devoted uh, to study how household, but also firm heterogeneity, influence the way monetary policy shocks propagate to the economy. It has been shown that assets uh, market participation, labor market participation, but even the share of home ownership in the economy significantly shape how monetary policy propagates. At the same time, it has been shown that monetary policy is able to influence inequality. Contraction in monetary policy shock, so an exogenous increase in the interest rate, lead to an increase in consumption, expenditure, and income inequality. And this is true for the US, for the UK, but also for the euro area. What we want to do in this paper is to focus on another form of heterogeneity, which is mainly overlooked by the literature. Inflation heterogeneity. Households, given their different consumption bundle, are exposed to different inflation rates. So what we want to do in this paper is to compute a measure of inflation rate at household level. And we try to answer this question. We have a distribution of individual inflation that evolve over time. We want to evaluate, first of all, whether monetary policy has anything to do with the way this distribution evolved. Moreover, we link this distribution to demographic characteristics to evaluate which demographic characteristics, which demographic group are more exposed to change in interest rate due to their different inflation rate. And finally, we want to evaluate whether once inflation heterogeneity is taken into account, does it change the estimated impact of monetary policy shock on expenditure inequality? Let me already give you a preview of the result. Regarding the first question, yes, following a contractionary monetary policy shock, inflation is dispersion is QNS decrease. Regarding the first question, we show that the dispersion of inflation along the income distribution, which we call inflation people, have on average a higher inflation rate than high income people, but following a monetary policy shock, that inflation rate reacts more uh, with respect to the inflation rate of the high income people, leading to a convergence of inflation rate across income groups. And finally, yes. Once inflation heterogeneity has been taken into account, the estimated impact of shocks on expenditure inequality is reduced. Still positive and significant, but more muted. What we do? We combine expenditure data from the consumer expenditure side with high monthly level inflation sub indices, everything from the Bureau of the Statistics. We define the year on year inflation rate of household high as the weighted average of the year on year inflation rate of expenditure category J using as weight the annual share of expenditure for household high on subgroup J. We take the annual share, so we remove any seasonality and our results are not biased by unusual purchase by the households. Let me show you here the year on year inflation rate uh, for the official CPI and here our median individual inflation. Uh, two things can you notice. First of all, we were able to track quite closely aggregate CPI. This is not surprising because we are using a procedure similar to the VLS and the data set is the, the, data set is the one actually used by the Bureau of Statistics. But we find this uh, plot quite interesting because it kind of show why for so many years we have been focused on the representative agent in our model. Because actually the median inflation rate is a good proxy for aggregate 
inflation rate. However, when I show you the scatter plot of the individual inflation rate, you see how much heterogeneity has been neglected so far by assuming that households are actually exposed to the same inflation rate. We have five, 7,000 observations per month, so we can compute different moments of the distribution, not only the median. And in particular, we will focus on um, three measures of dispersion, standard deviation, the difference between the 90th and the 10th percentile, and the interquantile range, and a measure of skewness. Uh, two things here. The first one is that the second moments are really strongly correlated, suggesting almost normal distribution over time. But the correlation between the second and the third, and the third moment is rather low, which is interesting because it will allow us to convey complementary information regarding the estimated impact of monetary policy shock on this distribution. Let me briefly talk about the methodology. We use a textbook um, instrumental variable local projection in which the change in the dependent variable is uh, shifted over time, is regressed over the lag of the dependent variable itself, a measure of the monetary policy shock, and the lag of the monetary policy shock. We use, in line with the literature, six lag for the dependent variable and 48 for the shock, but our results are completely robust for therapy specification. And in line with the literature, again, we use Romer and Romer as our Obviously, standard error are correct for this in order to account for uh, correlation across time and horizon. Let me show you here the input response function following a 100 basis point increase in the interest rate with a 1 165 confidence interval. You can see that uh, following a contraction of monetary policy shock, standard deviation, the difference between the 90 frame and the interquartile range, significantly and persistently decrease. So monetary policy shock uh, decrease dispersion in the economy. Now, this might be caused by different, uh, different, different things. So let me shed more lights on what's the main driver behind this result. We perform the same empirical specification, but using as dependent variable, the absolute difference between the 90th and the 50th percentile, which is basically a difference between the right tail and the median, and using as dependent variable, the difference between the left tail and the median. Both, uh, both difference decrease after a shock, but you can see that the magnitude of the difference between the right tail and the median is all, is almost twice as much as the magnitude of the left tail and the median. So actually the main driver behind the decrease in dispersion is the right tail of the distribution squeezing towards the median. If we assume an initial normal distribution, this would imply that skewness decrease is more negative. And that's exactly what we found uh, using skewness as dependent variable. Now you might be wondering, well, these are interesting results, these are new, but why policymaker and central bank care about this? To answer that question, we link the distribution of individual inflation rate to demographic characteristics. We have different demographic characteristics, but I will show you just the one I believe it's the most interesting. Here, I plot the input response function of the median inflation rate for different income, salary, and expenditure decide. The darker the line, the higher the decide. Two things can you notice here, and, and then sorry, we rescale this input response function such that at time zero, it's equal to the unconditional median of that demographic group. Two things, the higher the decile, the lower the median inflation rate. This is in line with the literature, but also following contraction and multiple shock, their inflation rate, the inflation rate of high income people decreased less than the inflation rate of the low income people, resulting in a convergence of inflation rate across income decides. And the same holds for salary and expenditure decides. Let me quickly show you one last result. We show the dispersion, inflation dispersion decrease. So obviously a natural question you may have is, well, what's the impact it has on the, on the other form of inequality? Well, in order to answer that question, we create two different series for real expenditure at household level. One in which each expenditure category is deflated by aggregate inflation. So neglecting inflation heterogeneity, and, and this is what has been done by the literature. And one in which each expenditure category is deflated by the proper price index. And we follow as close as possible the influential paper by Colvin et al. and compute different measure of the uh, log expenditure. So basically Gini standard deviation in the 90th term. And we replicate their empirical specification. So local projection with Romer and Romer Schwarzel. Let me show you the result. Here I plot the input function of expenditure inequality. Once uh, each expenditure category is deflated by aggregate inflation. So neglecting inflation heterogeneity for the standard deviation, Gini, and the 90th temper difference. The magnitude and the shape are similar to the original paper. So contraction and monetary policy shock lead to an increase in expenditure inequality. However, once I take into account inflation heterogeneity, 
So deflating each expenditure category by the proper inflation rate, you see I have a much more muted response. We are talking about a 20% decrease in standard deviation and 30% and the 90s, the coefficient is still significant and positive. So monetary policy has a redistributive effect. Finally, we obviously extend our um, specification uh, to different Basta check. But let, in the last 30 seconds, let me briefly conclude. So what we did in this paper is to compute inflation rate at household level, and we evaluate whether monetary policy shock had, had, has any role, played any role in the evolution of the distribution. And we find that indeed, monetary policy individual inflation dispersion and stimulus techniques. Moreover, we link the distribution to the demographic characteristic, and, and we show that households along the income distribution are heterogeneously exposed to change in interest rate through their different inflation rate. And finally, we show that taking into account inflation heterogeneity matters when it comes to estimating the impact of monetary policy shock on the other form of inequality. Thank you for your attention. I'm available to any questions in the chat. Is always uh, my call. Thanks yes. again for the availability. Wonderful that I didn't even have to give you a reminder on the time. That was perfect. Super interesting. Um, yeah, so please ask your questions in the Q&A if you have any. Um, and now we'll just go straight to Andra. You have 40 minutes. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my co-authors, Jesse Gregory and Mo Davis, are both on here so they can answer questions during the chat. What we're asking in this paper is we're looking at the effect of the work from home revolution and what drives it. So what we've got here is Scandinavian data, um, appropriate since Sweet, uh, Stockholm School of Economics is one of our hosts here. And you can see that pre-COVID, so this is the share of hours worked from home. And pre-COVID, this was about 10% in both Sweden and Norway. During COVID-19, it was about 80%. And based on employer surveys, Post COVID-19, the share of work from home is going to triple. It's going to shoot up almost to 30%. Uh, in the US, they've done household surveys and they find that it's actually a quadrupling expected of work from home relative to pre-pandemic levels. You know, this didn't actually happen overnight. It might seem like it did, but there were several discrete technological advances that allowed this to happen. Uh, the first, now I know there's probably many grad students on the uh, webinar, but there was a time when not everybody had a PC. Uh, that was widespread. We had saw widespread adoption of PCs with Office and Microsoft Excel around the mid 1990s. The Netscape public offering was in 1995, and that led to standardization of HTML and widespread use of the World Wide Web. Email, I can remember when I was an undergrad, this was sort of starting to become a thing. So around 2000 or so, people started adopting email. Relatively inexpensive high-speed home internet around the same time. Then we get cloud data and st uh, storage and adoption. That's ongoing, but it really started around 2010. Many of you remember Skype uh, around 2005 and 2007, but we really didn't get glitch-free internet video calls until you know, 2010, 2015. And then of course, during the pandemic, we've seen extremely widespread adoption. Many of these innovations aren't super useful if other people aren't using them. There's no point of writing an email if nobody's gonna read it, right? Uh, and if you don't think that you can pitch to your clients over Zoom, you're not going to suggest that. So if you're an accountant um, and you want to meet with your clients, if you don't think they have Zoom, you're gonna think you have to do it in person. Similarly with attorneys and other sort of white collar uh, jobs. So what we're asking in this paper is how the adoption of work from home technology will affect income, income inequality, rents, both commercial rents and residential rents, urban form, where people live, and where we work. What we do is we specify a model where high skill workers choose how much time to work at the office, and we assume the office is in a central business district, and then how much work to do at home. And there's differences in the productivity of work at home and work at the office. But the benefit of working from home is it doesn't require a commute. So there's this trade-off between commuting and productivity. What the model allows us to do is estimate the elasticity of substitution between work from home and work at the office using pre-pandemic data. Then we're gonna be able to use the model to understand how the COVID shock 
will affect income, rents, and urban form post-pandemic. And really what we think the COVID shock did in terms of our long-term effects, so post-pandemic, is it accelerated the adoption of work from home technology. And finally, we use the model to understand how the COVID shock affected the economy during the pandemic. So what we find is we have an elasticity of substitution of working from home versus the office of somewhere around five. We're gonna put some, some bounds on that, hopefully. Uh, we see a very large increase in the productivity of working from home during the pandemic. We infer that based on you know, what happened in the pre-work from home hours worked versus, the, sorry, the pre-pandemic work from home hours worked and the post-pandemic expectations. This was not because there was actual technological innovation during the pandemic. It was because of mass adoption effects. Long-term consequences, we find that office rents in the central business district will fall about 15% long-term. There's actually a larger increase in the share of hours worked from home in the long-term than immediately after the post-pandemic, after the pandemic. And the reason for that is that you need time for residential space to adjust. So people, some people are not super productive working from their garages or their attics or their kitchen table. And so as the supply of residential space has a chance to adjust, people get larger homes with larger home office and that allows them to work more from home. So there's increased demand for housing in the suburbs by 10 to 20%. There's an increase in the ratio of high skill to low skill consumption. And the reason for this is that the work from home only benefits uh, directly the high skill workers because low skill workers we assume cannot work from home. There's an even bigger increase in measured income inequality, but this is largely an accounting thing because what's going on is previously firms paid, paid for office space and now firms are gonna pay a little bit more in wages to high skilled workers because they're renting their own office space when they work from home. Um, so consequences during the pandemic, what we find is the pandemic would have been much more lethal and economically costly if it had happened prior to the existence of work from home technology. So obviously the pandemic has been uh, very lethal and very costly for households, even those that didn't have the morbidity and mortality consequences, but it would have been even worse had it happened and nobody could have worked from home. So there's a few literatures this is related to. One is technological adoption. So this idea of an externality in adoption, this is consistent with these models of Katz and Shapiro and Brock and Durloff. There's also a literature on work from home prior to the pandemic that we build on. A lot of this is based on call centers. Uh, we're looking at a broader class of workers than just call center workers. I put call center workers because once they work from home, it's hard to think of them as, as center workers. Um, we are also looking at the long-term effects of COVID. And what we're probably closest related to is these papers by Delventhal and Parkamenko. The difference with our work is twofold. First of all, we specify the technological process through which work from home increased. Secondly, we do not assume that work at home and work at the office are perfect substitutes. We allow these to not be perfect substitutes. So that's the main difference between our work. Okay, so our model is an urban model where we have work from home. There's two types of workers. Low skilled workers, we're gonna call these type zeros. They only can work at a firm and they have to commute. They do not have the option of working from home. High skilled workers, these guys are type one and they choose the fraction of their time that they work in the firm's office. If they go to the office, they have to commute or they can work at home. All workers get to choose where they live. So they choose one of two residential zones. They choose their non-housing consumption and they choose how much housing to rent. High school workers have an additional choice. They have to choose how much office space to rent at home and on behalf of firms at the office. So low skilled workers, they're choosing this location N, one or two, they consume, uh, Consumption, C, N, not. So again, this not superscript denotes the type. Housing, H, N, not. And then hours worked to maximize utility subject to budget and time constraints. So their utility is specific to the location in a couple ways. First of all, they can choose different um, consumption and housing depending on their location, but they also get 
amenities, chi n naught. So again, n index indexes the location. So these are amenities associated with that particular location. So it could be proximity to skiing. It could be nice weather. It could be nice restaurants, crime. And we allow the amenity they get to depend on the type. This is their, uh, again, their non-housing consumption, their housing consumption, and then uh, LN naught is their leisure. They also have this fixed utility for a particular location that does not depend on these choices. So their budget and time constraints, they have, this is their income. So their wage times the hours worked. This is divided between their non-housing consumption and their housing consumption, which they rent at RN. And then their time constraint, they split between leisure and how many hours they work. And they have to pay this commuting tax, TN naught, as a, a fraction of the hours worked. ENI is an IID type one shock and new deport determines the importance of the draw. So you can see they're trading off between this piece and this piece and deciding on their location. High skill workers. They choose their location as well. They also choose non-housing consumption. They choose housing consumption. And then they choose hours worked at home, LNH. And they choose hours worked at the office, LNB. So the superscript now denotes either home or at the office, and office is B. They also choose office space rented in both locations. So office space rented at home is SHN. And then you can think of these guys almost like we work workers when they go into work, where they're choosing how much space to rent at the office, SBN. And so they similarly have these uh, amenities from their location. Again, this depends on the type. Um, and then they have these fixed draw to determine their preference for a specific location independent of the amenities of that location. Their budget and time constraints. So this is their total income. So why, and I'm gonna show you in the next slide, that is an aggregate of the two types of production they do, the production they do at home and the production they do at the office. They divide this total income between non-housing consumption, housing consumption, and then we've got this additional space that they rent. And then their leisure, uh, if this location is LN1, and they have these two times, uh, this is the amount of labor they, produce, they, they use at the office, and this is the labor they use at home. So each unit of output from these high-skilled workers is paid W1, and it's an aggregate of home and firm effective hours. And so you can see that these are the hours again, this is the output that they produce at the office. This is the output they produce at home. And rho is gonna determine the sub substitutability between these two different types of work. And they produce at the office using this technology, the total factor productivity of work at the office is AB. This is the space they rent at the office. And then this is the labor they work at the office. Similarly for home output, total factor productivity at home is AH, and we're gonna specify those in just a couple slides. This is the space they rent, and this is the output they produce. They, and this is the labor they use there. Um, why do we not think they're perfect substitutes? So what we've plotted here is the share of EU workers that usually and sometimes work from home. And what you'll see is that over 1995 to 2019, the biggest increase in work from home was not workers that usually work from home, but those that sometimes work from home. So there's far more workers that sometimes work from home than usually work from home. That's why we don't think they're necessarily perfect substitutes. Okay, so from the first order conditions for this model, we derive this optimal allocation of time between work at the office and work at home. And it depends on relative total factor productivity, relative rents, and commuting costs. It also depends on, again, the elasticity of substitution between these two types of work, and then the share of space in production. This equation is going to be what we use to estimate the elasticity of substitution using cross-sectional data from before the pandemic. Low and high-skilled workers 
are complements in production. So here is output from or labor directly from low skilled workers, and here's output from high skilled workers. We are going to allow for agglomeration and high skilled work at the office, as well as adoption effects for high skilled work at home. So our total factor productivity at the office depends on this fixed parameter A bar B. And then this is the number of the amount of hours coming into the central business district raised to the power of delta B. So delta B controls our agglomeration economies. And then we have total factor productivity of uh, hours of work at home. Again, depends on this fixed parameter A bar H, but then it depends on the historical maximum number of hours worked at home. So it doesn't depend on the current number of hours being worked at home. It depends on the historical maximum. And the idea we have here is that, you know, even if you're not using Zoom as intensively post pandemic, the fact that you became very good at using Zoom during the pandemic means that you didn't lose that productivity once you go back down to working one or two days a week from home. So the equilibrium is a vector of wages and rents such that uh, markets for space and labor clear and then low and high skill workers optimally choose where to live, hours worked, non housing consumption and housing services. So our calibration and estimation strategy we're going to equate our high skilled workers in the data with those with a four year degree. We have two residential zones inner suburbs and outer suburbs. Our strategy to estimate rho, which controls the elasticity of substitution, is to use that first order condition using cross sectional data on commuting times and hours worked from home. For some parameters, uh, we can use estimates from other studies. And then there's a set of parameters that we use method of moments for the population shares in each zone, relative rental rates, and then the pre pandemic share of high skilled hours worked from home. So, again, here's our first order condition for estimating rho, and we can take logs of that. And then we estimate this equation using data from the current population survey, the American Time Use Survey. And then there's a special module, the leave and job flexibility of 2017 to 2018. And the nice thing about that module is it tells us the fraction of days respondents commute to work. So in addition to knowing on any particular day does the respondent work uh, from home, we know the fraction of days they work. Uh, the CPS, the main ben benefit is the demographics and the occupation. We're going to denote this coefficient phi on the log of one plus commuting time. Uh, and we're going to estimate phi using GMM. We're going to correct for measurement error in commuting times, which we think is, is fairly significant. So the model predicts that we always have positive hours worked at the office and positive hours worked at home. Um, in practice, we sometimes observe zero hours worked at home, and that's a small uh, time window issue. So what we're going to do is we're going to transform the equation to a logit for time spent working at the office as a function of total time. So this is going to be our estimating equation. So we're C bar I now is the fraction of days respondent I reports working in the office. And why is this ratio of hours worked at the office? and hours worked at home. And then XI are demographics and industry and occupation dummies. TI is the commuting time reported by individual I. And again, phi is our coefficient of interest. So just gut check on, does this estimation strategy make sense? So what we're going to use to, to identify the elasticity is the fact that people with longer commute times work more from home. And that's exactly what we observe in the data. So People that have commute times of 45 to 59 minutes do indeed work. So this is the share of respondents that work one day, at least one day per month at home. This is the share that work, work at least two days per month at home, and then one day per week, and then three days per week. And you see that as commute time rises, the share of hours worked at home also rises. Now you might be concerned that there is some selection and who lives far from the office. And 
you know, we're a little concerned about that, but when we add covariates for occupation and industry fixed effects, we really see very little difference in our estimates, which makes us feel like it's not a, a terrible idea. Um, we see a lot of rounding in commute times. So our estimation strategy is going to try to deal with that rounding. You can see that a number of people re re uh, report commute times of exactly five minutes, exactly 10 minutes, a lot of exactly 15 and exactly 30. And our strategy here is going to be to use one commute time as an instrument for the other commute time. So there's measurement error in both. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use the one as an instrument for the other. You might be concerned that there's some correlation between these measurement errors. And you are actually right, because if you see the difference between the two reported commutes, um, a lot of households actually have zero difference. And so what we do is we have an analytical bias correction that allows for some possibility of correlation between these measurement errors. And we do a Monte Carlo to check, is this reasonable? And I'm gonna show you estimates of our elasticity of substitution using different assumptions about the correlation structure, uh, correlation structure of the measurement errors. Okay, so our first two columns we do not correct for measurement error. The first column, we also don't include any demographics, industry fixed effects, or occupation fixed effects. When we estimate the elasticity of substitution that way, we get about three. What makes us more comfortable that selection is not everything that determines how far you live from the central business district is once we add demographics, industry fixed effects, and occupation fixed effect, we still get something pretty close to three. So things are not changing a lot once we control for observable characteristics. Here's our estimate with our analytic bias correction for the measurement error. When we include all the covariates and we assume that the measurement error is uncorrelated. So now we have about 4.5 as the estimate for the elasticity of substitution. Here we assume the correlation is 10% the elasticity of substitution goes up to about 4.7. Here we assume it's 25%. And then here we assume it's a full 50%. So this is a, a fairly extreme value for the correlation. And here we get elasticity substitution of seven. So we're going to basically center our calibration on five for the elasticity of substitution, but we're gonna look at the model predictions when we have elasticity of substitution as low as three and as high as seven. So alpha naught is the housing expenditure share. We allow this to differ between low-skilled and high-skilled households based on the fact that in the data you see low-income households spend a much larger fraction of their income on rent. So we allow this to be 33% for low-skilled households and 20% for high-skilled households. The importance of location on Monty, Redding, and uh, Rossi Hansberg. And then the sh share of structures in production, we set to 0.18. And then the elasticity of substitution between low and high-skilled labor is 1.5. That's based on the Otter and Katz paper. You take Moe's paper with Tony Wolf. but we're gonna look at values as high as 0.1 to see if that changes the effects. Okay, targeted moments given, zone, given the zone definitions, we target a commute time from zone one. So zone one is the inner suburb, zone two is the outer suburb. We target that to be 30 minutes each way. For zone two, the outer suburb is 50 minutes. The share of low skilled workers living in zone two, we're gonna target that moment. That, we jointly calibrate the model to match all these moments, but chi two naught is sort of more naturally associated with that moment, and chi two one is more naturally associated with the share of high skilled workers living in zone two. The age adjusted income of high skill relative to low skill, we set that to 1.8, which primarily determines lambda. And then the share of work at home for high skilled uh, prior to the pandemic, 10%. 
that primarily determines our A bar. Finding our zones. We're going to look at counties that are adjacent to the central business district as zone one, so inner suburbs. All other counties within that core base statistical area, we consider zone two. Our model features monocentric cities on cities that look kind of monocentric. So New York City, we also need a certain number of observations. And so we don't look at very small cities. Rents, we match these to relative values for the New York City core based statistical area, given the availability of prices per square foot at the county level. Uh, so we're gonna normalize rent per square foot on Manhattan office space to one. And then residential rents per square foot in counties next to Manhattan, uh, we set those to 0.35. And then residential rents per square foot in New York City counties not adjacent, we set that to 0.24 based on an assumption for the rent to price ratio and the observed price per square foot. OK, the COVID shock. We're going to model this as a 50% cut to productivity at the office. We then capture the increase in work from home productivity during the pandemic as the increase in total factor productivity at home required to triple high skilled hours work from home post pandemic relative to the pre pandemic level. So what we find is that total factor productivity of work from home increased by 46% during the pandemic. So what's going on here is because of social distancing, total factor productivity at the office falls dramatically. This is the 50% cut in the fixed portion of total factor productivity at the office. This is A bar B. What happens, even though work from home is less productive, people start working a whole lot more from home because given the fall in A bar B, it's still more productive to work at the office because you have this temporarily very low productivity of work at the office. And then we're going to use some post-pandemic counterfactuals. So the first one is a short run counterfactual. And when we say short run, we mean sometime, you should think of the short run as maybe fall 2021. So the health effects of the pandemic are basically done. But we haven't had a chance to build a whole lot more residential space yet. So we fix the supply of space to our baseline in the central business district our, and our two residential zones, and we allow rents to adjust. The second counterfactual post-pandemic we consider is the long run. Here, the price of space is fixed to the baseline in the central business district, zone one and zone two and supply has had a chance to adjust. So here we're assuming, you know, when we say long run, it depends a little bit on how long it takes to build new construction, but we think, you know, three, five years out post pandemic. So we've had a chance to build, there's this increased demand for housing in particular, and we have a chance to build all that new housing and rents come back down. And then the last post pandemic counterfactual we consider is a long run putty clay counterfactual here. The supply of space is fixed in the central business district to the baseline and prices adjust. What we have in mind here is that you can't destroy London and Manhattan office buildings. So, so there's sort of a, a one way uh, change in the supply of space. We do allow zone one and zone two uh, residential space to adjust, but not the, we're not knocking down office buildings in Manhattan and New York City. And so rents are going to be fixed to our baseline in zone one and zone two, and the quantities adjust. So the first column here is our benchmark pre-pandemic. And so you can see that work from home is much less productive pre-pandemic. This is immediately after the pandemic. And so you can see that this is 
this 46% increase in the productivity of work from home between the pre-pandemic level. So think of this as January, 2020, and immediately after the pandemic. So again, think of this as fall 2021. So we have this big increase in the total factor productivity of working at home. And the reason, well, how do we get this number? We get this number because we're tripling the share of high-skilled hours worked at home. So it's going from 10% pre-pandemic to 30%. The next column, this is, again, maybe think 2023, 2024, after the supply of space has had a chance to adjust. And what you see now is a further increase in the share of hours that are worked from home relative to the pre-pandemic level. And what's going on here is now, it's no longer the case that nice houses in the suburbs are crazy expensive like they are now because we've built new housing in the suburbs. And so people have the home office, they're more productive at home. And so they increase further the share of hours worked from home. And then this is our last post uh, COVID counterfactual where this is the putty clay scenario where we're not knocking down uh, central business district office space. And here you see, you know, somewhere in between the short run and the long run because office space is super cheap here in the central business district. So you don't see quite the same increase in work from home. One thing to note, this fall in the productivity of working in the central business district, it's small. That's due to decreased agglomeration economies. So we have fewer people coming into the central business district. And so that decreases our, our knowledge spillovers in that area. Here are relative rents and demand for space post COVID. So you can see that immediately post COVID, rents downtown fall to about 85% of their pre pandemic level. By design, they go back up to one in our long run counterfactual. And here's our long run putty clay fat counterfactual where they're down to about 83% of their pre-pandemic level. Residential rents increase in both zones. The percentage increase is larger in the outer suburbs because people are willing to live further away from work because they're not commuting further away from their office at, at the, in the central business district because they don't have to commute as much. Um, again, by design, these go back down to their pre-pandemic levels in the long run counterfactual and the putty clay counterfactual. What happens to space? So what you see here is home office per high skill in zone one triples. Okay, so here we're not allowing the supply of space to adjust yet. We haven't been able to build a whole lot more homes. And so what happens is this fixed amount of space, a much larger fraction goes towards home office. So high-skilled workers actually consume a little bit less housing in terms of their consumption housing, and low-skilled workers consume even less. The big increase, the big shift is towards home office. And in our long run, we get an even bigger increase in home office per high skill. It's, an e it's actually close to, uh, it it's a quadrupling in zone two. So the increase in zone two is even larger. Here's income inequality. So again, some of this is measurement. So this is pre-COVID the ratio of high skill to low skill income. This goes up to about 1.92 or in the short run and then 1.93 in the long run. And that's about an 8% increase. And the reason for this is that the increase in total factor productivity primarily benefits the high skilled workers because they're the ones that can work from home. There is some increase in income for low-skilled workers and income for low-skilled workers. And that's because they're a complement in the production function to high-skilled labor. That's why their income does increase a little bit. And you can see that the share of high skill in zone one goes down. They're willing to live further out into the suburbs now because they're not commuting as frequently. And so the share of high skill goes down in zone one and goes up in zone two. So adoption effects. So we found that AH increased by about 46% during the pandemic. And we specified total factor productivity of work from home as driven by this fixed parameter A bar H. And then the maximum historical number of hours 
worked uh, from home, raised the power of Delta H. What we assume here is that there wasn't massive innovation in work from home technology. We didn't come up with brand new technologies because it only lasted about a year, right? Many of us are getting back to the office in the next couple months. So what we assume is that A bar H is fixed and this allows us to identify the uh, adoption effects. So here is the maximum number of hours worked during the pandemic. And previously it had only been 0 0.07. And so this allows us to, to measure Delta H as 8.18. So a 10% 10 10 increase in the total number of hours work from home raises TFP at home by 1.8%. Finally, we want to talk about what had happened, what, what would have happened if we didn't have work from home technology. So we're going to consider 1990 as a time where we didn't have most of these inventions. Most people didn't have email. Many people did not have PCs at home, certainly not high speed internet. So if you look at what happened during the 1918 to 1920 pandemic, there was actually very little social distancing. And it was a much more lethal virus, as most of you know, particularly for prime age workers. So to understand what would have happened, so this certainly the 1918 to 1920 pandemic would have been a time when work from home was not available. We're going to consider 1990, where we assume that there's maybe some work from home technology, but it's about 30% of what we calibrated AH to be for 2019. And then as in our 2020 pandemic counterfactual, we, measure, we model the COVID shock as a 50% decrease in the productivity of working in the CBD. So here's the 1990 pandemic and here's the 2020 pandemic. And what you see is there's a very dramatic fall in income for both low skill and high skill workers in the 1990 pandemic relative to what we saw in the 2020 pandemic. So in the 2020 pandemic, there is a fall in income but it's not as dramatic. So again, by design, the way we model the counterfactual here is that we cut AB by 50% in both uh, counterfactuals. AH, so this is the start of COVID that we're uh, modeling in, in, model, in column two and column four. So we keep the level of total factor productivity at what it was pre-pandemic. So think of this as you know, March, 2020, we're all struggling to learn Zoom. And what you see is the share of hours worked from home in a 1990 pandemic would have been minimal. It goes up, but really minimal because it's just not feasible to offset the pandemic by working from home. Um, and so, you know, not surprisingly, you don't see uh, quite as dramatic a change in rents during 1990 as you do during the 2020 pandemic. Uh, we do some sensitivity to the elasticity of substitution of work from home and work at the office. Um, the main intuition that comes out of this is that with a very low elasticity of substitution, you have to have much lower productivity of work from home to justify only seeing 10% of hours work from home pre-pandemic um, given greater complementarity. But our overall sort of message for rents and income inequality is pretty much the same whether we use three or whether we use seven. Uh, greater agglomeration economies in the CBD, similar take home story here. It doesn't, from, if we use uh, an agglomeration parameter of 10%, it doesn't dramatically change our predictions for rents, income inequality, or what happened to total factor productivity of working from home during the pandemic. It does decrease, not surprisingly, you see a bigger decline in total factor productivity at the office when people work more from home because you're seeing less agglomeration economy. Okay, so to wrap up, what we think happened during the pandemic is that accelerated growth in the productivity of working from home. And this came from adoption effects. Again, we're not thinking that Zoom was invented in 2021. We think that people learned to adopt it and that's what led to the increase in productivity. Our model offers a framework to study the effect of this increase. With the higher productivity of work at home, we expect office rents to fall and that's gonna be permanent. Um, increased demand for housing in the suburbs especially for home office space. And if you've tried to look at the housing market in any kind of nice city with large shares of skilled workers, uh, this is certainly being borne out in the data right now. And then we see a large increase in measured in income, income inequality and a slightly smaller uh, increase in uh, consumption inequality.
I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna let my co-authors take all the, the hard questions because I'm tired of talking. Wonderful, thank you so much. Super interesting stuff. Um, so now we're gonna have the uh, live Q&A portion of VMAT. So if you have a question for either of the presenters, uh, just raise your hand and I'll call on you and unmute you. Um, I'm also gonna paste the, this link for um, after for the more informal uh, conversation in another in another chat room. So I guess I'll start, I think uh, Ralph had a question. So I'll start with Ralph. Hey, uh, great presentation, Andra. Just a quick question, which is I guess also more of a robustness uh, check uh, question. So um, don't you think um, that commuting cost is mainly a function of congestion? So when I think of you know London or LA, I think you know it's mostly congestion. So if you would allow for that, that would mute some of your effects. So do you have like an estimate for this? Or no? um, we considered that in an earlier version of the model, and we took it out because we weren't sure how to calibrate it. But we might, um, given your thought, we might put it back in. Uh, we have to think about that. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Is is it's sort of. I mean, with an extreme case, you could, I think you could see multiple equilibria, but we can think about putting some uh, congestion costs back in. We certainly have a version of the model with congestion costs, yeah. Okay, great. I'm muted, okay. So there's a question in the chat that maybe you, one of the authors would like to answer from Sahib. Uh, so, so can you shed more light why home office has rent because people have home before the pandemic? Um, I mean, you, so you have a house before the pandemic, right? But, and you can divide that house into some office space and some living space. Um, but the idea is that uh, you, you can't, there is some kind of fixed portion of you need some space to work and you have to pay for that. So, and that's certainly, you know, there's a paper by Chris Stanton that bears this out that people who work from home more have larger homes, right? I mean, early in the pandemic, I think if you'd talk to people that were, didn't have a home where they could work at home, um, you know, they weren't super productive. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a total amount of space. And the idea is that yes, maybe some of it you can get consumption benefits from as well. Um, but some of it is, is space you need to use to produce your market work. Uh, Jesse, do you Andrew, can, I, can I chime in too? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. So I think the Stanton estimate is that roughly speaking, if you work some from home, the, your expenditure share on rent is about 10% larger than if you don't work at all from home. And actually in our base, so that, that tells you that people that work from home have larger houses. And our baseline calibration is consistent with that estimate, even though we didn't target that specifically. Great. Um, so there is another question in the chat. I would encourage everyone in the audience to raise their hand and ask it live. We're in a safe space, so don't be shy. <laughs> um, but uh, if one of the authors wants to uh, answer the question in the chat, you can do that as well. Sure. Mo, do you want to take this or Jesse? Do you want to read the question out loud and then I'll, I'll, I'll sure. see. Okay. <laughs> I'll be the, I'll be the reader. Full uh, participation from everybody. Hi, great paper. Many thanks. A general expected three times or four times increase in work from home results in much less commuting, which is likely to hit profits of transportation services from suburbs to centers, and then a hike in prices and cut in availability that may potentially change the balance of attractiveness back in favor of centers, a change of chi in the model. Could that be quantitatively important? I'll, I'll take, do you want me to take a stab at this, Andre, or would you like Yes, to? go ahead, take a stab. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, we're not, there might be these, um, there might be effects on, from lack of commuting, there might be a lot of effects. The global warming, there could be changes. Uh, to energy consumption because of that. There could be changes due to working more from home and less in the office. We don't know if that's more or less energy intensive. With less commuting, there could be less smog and less pollution. And that could, depending on, I think, prevailing winds, that could make certain parts of the city more or less attractive. So there are a lot of these uh, spill-on effects we don't touch that we think 
could be important. Um, so, you know, when you read our paper, there, that, those caveats should be in mind. Great. Um, okay, so I, I have uh, maybe two questions, or I'll, I'll start with one in case anyone jumps in. Um, so I guess you're mostly thinking about like the data that, that we do see as, uh, let's say, coming from a framework in which everyone can just freely choose, like whether, well, the high skilled worker, whether to work from home or, or, or work in the office, right? Um, and I'm just thinking about like my own setup, but there's rule, like the employer imposes rules. And like, you can only work from home like one day out of every two weeks or something like this. So I'm wondering whether maybe it doesn't matter if we like conceptually think of it like that, which is more of actually what we see is that there's a constraint on what you can do in terms of the split of hours. Um, or if it's maybe it doesn't matter if we, if it, if it comes about that way. And if so, so thought, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that you have to assume here that, you know, in our model, workers, they will internalize any lower productivity. Um, but I think that if you have wage contracts where um, I think the reason pre-pandemic that employers would not allow everybody to work from home five days a week is because they had a single wage contract offer that didn't depend on how much you work from home. And I think that that's the reason you saw rules if you have a single wage instead of what we have is basically um you know they internalize that because they're 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 selling effective labor um i will say that there's evidence from this work from home literature pre-pandemic that the types of workers also who chose to work from home were less productive so the call center workers if you randomize the call center workers that work from home they were actually more productive but the selection effects was really bad because the people who chose to work from home were for some reason the less productive workers. So this is outside of our model, but I think that one of the things about um, the, everybody working from home during the pandemic, it's removed that stigma. And the stigma was there for good reason, right? The stigma basically was, was borne out by the data is that the people who are choosing to work from home pre-pandemic are, are less productive people. So, when, but when you randomize again, so it, it, uh, Nick Bloom sort of makes this point as well about, you know, removing the stigma and maybe that's part of the increase in productivity is once you allow people to optimally, to, you allow everybody, including your more productive workers to work from home. Um, Jesse or Mo, do you want to chime in on that as well? I mean, there's also an issue of this differences across industry and occupation for the measurement. So we were worried a lot that you would, we're essentially looking at the relationship between the fraction of time that you work at home and your commuting costs. And if you have people who are working industries where they know they have to go into the office every day, they might choose to live in places with, that are closer to work. And that would, that would generate bias for, for, our, for our procedure. Um, that's why it's important that we essentially get the same answer when we look within industry and occupation. Um, but from then kind of how you wanna think about the model, taking an estimate of this elasticity um, uh, I would, yeah, uh, Andres kind of handled that part. Yeah, we're relying a lot on wage competition. If an employer forces you to do something that lowers your productivity, I guess we have in the back of your mind, even though we don't model it, that you just take a different job where you'd get a higher wage because you could adjust your hours to sort of maximize your utility or your productivity. But that's not... Yeah, so Laura, it's a tough question. So <laughs> I maybe like one thing, I don't know if it's possible, but there, like in the work that I did with Simon and Alex, you, you have there we there we use the measure from ONET to, to get a sense of like, can you hypothetically work from home? And then the ATUS is really a measure of like how much did you? And so if you use like specific occupations where you know like they can completely 100 percent do it and just focus on those those occupations um, to get these estimates, because then we can think of it more of as like unconstrained. If we see them not doing it, that would give us a better sense of like these estimates or something like that. Um, anyway, we should move on. We have like time for one more question, I think, until we move to the private room. And I see Karen Kopp is raising his hand, so I'll let you talk. Um, please unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, interesting paper. I just read. 
I'm just wondering uh, what, about the overall TFP. What happened to that? I can see that some people who, very high skilled people who are working from home, their productivity possibly increased. But the overall, when you take care of this low skilled and high skilled together, they, did it improve or did I miss something there? I'm just wondering about that. That is first question. I have another question that you just increase demand for housing. How quickly you can really buy a house, right? It is within the short pandemic period. Suppose I am suffering from shortage of workspace and I want to go to buy a bigger house, but that takes time, right? So how does the whole thing work here? So these are really practical questions, right? Um, I'll take, I, I can take the first part. Uh, so we don't assume any change in total factor productivity of working uh, for, uh, for low skilled workers. Nothing changes for them during the pandemic. It's all on the work from home front. Um, so that's, that's the assumption of the model is that we see that, that that's what's changing during the model. Um, the second part of your question was about how quickly you can buy a home. I mean, I think you um, yeah, we are allowing rents to adjust, which means there has to be some housing transactions. And uh, by the end of the pandemic, yeah, we assume that people are able, it does take a few months, but our counterfactual is between say January, 2020 and, or is it January? Yeah, January, 2020 and say fall 2021. And certainly people who need to change their housing demand, they, they can buy a house in a year and a half. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, okay, great. So I think we're just out of time now. So anyone who wants to continue the discussion should join the, the chat link that I posted in the chat. And uh, thank you all for attending. Great talks today. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for having us. This has been super useful. Thank you. Thanks all for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Laura has gone to start the other meeting. I'll keep this running uh, for another minute or two because once I end it, you'll lose the link. Uh, so, but feel free to click on the link in the chat and go keep Laura company. So yeah, thank you for coming, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. And remember, next week, everyone in the US, daylight savings, we have it in Europe. So we'll be back to noon. So, thanks.